Recent rains have infused a fresh surge of life into the Yala River. Thousands of litres of fresh water now thunder across it on its journey from the highlands in the Mao Forest and into the Lake Victoria. The storm lashed waters bring essential nutrients hidden beneath to the banks, and there's a living to be made by those who can cope with the fast current. The banks of Ayala River are sparsely populated. The river does not flow through any urban or densely populated area. Perhaps that's why it's still as pristine. The same cannot be said of many of the other rivers that flow into the Lake Victoria. The River Migori is one of such several streams that connect this region to the lake. Its waters travel cold from the forests in Transmara, out over the flat plains, through Migori town and into the river Kuja as it carves its way into the heart of the Lake Victoria. The river courses past a sun-bleached collection of make-do tin shelters that dot the plains. Here, a community slowly poisons itself to earn a living. This is the Osiri Matanda gold mine near Kenya's border with Tanzania. There's no sparkle about this village, just a people scratching a living from the gold deposits underneath and on a very small scale. An average miner gets around 2 grams a day on a good day. A gram of gold sells for about 3,800 shillings. The miners use mercury, an installed solution to extract gold from the ore. But mercury is a type of deadly venom for the river that snakes past the village and all who live off it. Since the time began, uh, we were born here, and this is the source of water where those who dwell around, they fetch water from this river. Also, those who are doing farming, they do irrigation using this, uh, this small generator to pump water to their chambers. Some 10 years back down the line, uh, people used to fish uh, in this river, but recently uh, fish is no longer there. But if it is there, they are not quite a number. Could be, maybe the water is polluted. And that's why you know, you know to find uh, maybe life inside the water that can accommodate fish. The procedure looks simple enough. As the tumblers rattle and spin, the gold ore breaks down and the flecks of gold bind to the mercury. So after this is the... the first sign is the mixture of gold and mercury has to be put to the fire to extract the gold, releasing dangerous mercury gas into the environment. The run of poisonous waste also seeps into the ground mixes with the treatment water and flows downstream, where it joins the river. High doses of mercury are a well-documented cause of birth defects, including crippling deformities and nervous and immune system disorders. The most notorious episode of mercury poisoning occurred in Japan in the 1950s when a factory dumped the heavy metal into Minamata Bay, 
more than 2,000 people were poisoned by the bay's seafood. Some died, while dozens of children suffered severe birth defects. But mercury poisoning can be difficult to diagnose because it has many symptoms in common with other ailments. And in the absence of government warnings or controls on the use of mercury, it is easy for the miners to dismiss its effects. County government has also sensitized people on the dangers which are caused by the mercury. And uh, to the other miners who go down the shaft, they're using the helmet and also the hand gloves, also the gum boots, uh, for them to protect their bodies when they work under the ground. The dangers of the mercury, people have not started realizing the signs and symptoms. They just hear that people say that there are some dangers of mercury. Tangu nizaliwe paka nifike huu mwuri, sijaona meki muta mbaa meathrika juu ya mekiuri. Ndapo kama kuna madara, lakini hapa kwetu sijaona. Some of the symptoms are not clear. The person could get health problems without knowing. Some of them will get them even before they are born because uh, when the mothers consume, pregnant women, when they consume those chemicals, that will damage the brain of even the, the baby before it's born. The Nzoia River rises from the Cherangani Hills, providing a lifeline to more than 3 million people on its 257-kilometer journey to the Lake Victoria. It flows through the region's agricultural belt, where it waters the cotton, maize and sugarcane fields. Every year, the river pushes over its banks. The silt it leaves behind in the lowlands of Budalangi improves the area's agricultural production. But the river is now a victim of the very agricultural activities it has helped prosper, as it collects a number of toxicants, including pesticides, along its way. Around Webuye, the industrial center, the river absorbs effluent from the Webuye paper mill. The death of the paper plant in 2009 was seen as an environmental blessing. Residents often complained that the plant often belched acrid smoke into the air and pumped a noxious liquid into the ground below. A strong smell of sulfur was one of the town's defining features. Now the hums of the machines is back on, breathing new life into the town but also into concerns about what eventually causes into their lifeblood. As it nears the mouth, it causes past an unkempt collection of temporary structures a small offshore community that has made homes in the fast-flowing water. <laughs> Hidden from the world, their lives are keyed with the river's natural rhythms. For the Sango people, the river is the principal highway, transporting goods and people to and from neighbouring Uganda. They have forged such an intimate relationship with the water that they rarely leave it. But this community has no sanitation facilities. All their waste ends up in the river, which then winds through an amassment of reeds and weeds as it pumps its contents into the Lake Victoria. The Nyando River rises from the high rainfall areas of Nandi and Kericho. When it rains, it waters flood the plains. But residents of Mohoroni, in the river's middle reaches, say there's something more sinister in the water. 
two of Muhoroni's residents have moved to court to demand the closure of the agrochemicals and food company over a virulent discharge from the factory that poisons the river Nyando waters and the fish in it. They also want NEMA to cancel their discharge license for failing to meet the standards for discharge into sewers and rivers. The noxious mix flows further downstream through a Hero town where it picks up the town's mark on the way to the lake. But first, it provides nourishment to the rice fields at the Ahero Irrigation Scheme, one of the biggest rice farming belts in the Nyanza region. The chemical fertilizers used in the acres of rice paddies drain back into the water, which mixes with the river as it flows downstream. To understand how all this has conspired to snuff the life out of a lake, we took samples at 28 different points around the lake's watershed and after nearly three months of tests and analysis, the results are startling. In all the areas that we sampled, over 20 places, there is no single place that we didn't identify a toxicant. In all the rivers, in all the various parts of the lake, at different depths, all the samples contain one or more of the toxicants that we are looking for. I can authoritatively say that uh, based on what we found, the lake contains chemicals and uh, bacteria and other disease-causing organisms, which would be of very serious concern, considering the high increase in incidences of many diseases. Cancer today has become a very serious problem. People don't know where it is coming from. But I, as a toxicologist, I can say without uh, doubt that some of these chemicals are responsible for the increase in those diseases. There was a heavy presence of heavy metals such as mercury, lead, cadmium, chromium, zinc, iron, manganese and fluoride occurring at different thresholds in the water, in the fish and sediment tested at different points. There's a high risk of exposure to mercury for frequent fish eaters, pregnant women and developing children. Continued exposure to mercury has been known to cause leukemia, retardation, miscarriages and stillbirths among women. It can also cause damage to the kidneys and to a body's immune system. Exposure to high levels of lead may slow down the mental, nervous system and physical development in children. Even low-level lead exposure in developing babies has been found to affect behavior and intelligence. In adults, it affects the blood pressure, causes kidney damage and can cause miscarriages and stillbirths in women and infertility in both men and women. Exposure to high levels of copper can also cause liver and kidney damage. Manganese affects the respiratory system, the brains and the nerves, and can cause forgetfulness. Cadmium is a silent killer that attacks the kidneys and other vital organs such as the heart. If it accumulates in the body, it also causes the bones to become weaker. Zinc is a trace element that is essential for human health. But too much of it can damage the pancreas. Extensive exposure can cause respiratory disorders. Iron too is important for the body, but it causes a host of ills when it's out of balance. Excess iron is deposited in the liver, the heart and the pancreas, causing damage to the organs. It can also cause liver cancer and diabetes. The samples of water, fish and sediment collected at the mouth of River Awach had the highest number of these heavy metals and at levels way above the safety threshold. The samples were found to have high levels of mercury, lead, cadmium, chromium and iron. 
The second most contaminated point was River Kisat, which also takes in what is meant to be treated effluent from the Kiwasko treatment plant. It was found to have mercury, lead, cadmium, chromium and iron at levels above the recommended safety threshold. River Migori was found to dump into the lake high levels of mercury that it collects from the gold mines, high levels of lead, cadmium and chromium. If we did a survey on the, on the diseases or the condition that these people are experiencing, like in that region, definitely you will find that the effects must have been taking place and maybe there is nobody to tell them that this whatever you are experiencing is because of what you are exposing yourself to. Because we know you have mercury, you are vaporizing the mercury and therefore you have uh, mercury vapor directly going to your lungs. That's toxication direct. Leave alone the one that now comes to the water bodies. Samples from the effluent from the Kibos sugar factory were contaminated with lead and cadmium at levels way above the safety threshold. Samples of the discharge from the Kodiaga prison show they were also heavily contaminated with lead and cadmium. The effluent from the pan paper plant at Webuye was found to have lead at 0.09 milligrams per litre against a recommended standard of 0.01 milligrams per liter. It had copper at 0.45 milligrams per liter against a standard of 0.05 milligrams per liter. It also had zinc, iron, manganese and fluoride at levels higher than the safety standards. The samples from Marenga Beach in Port Victoria were highly contaminated with lead, copper, iron, manganese, zinc and fluoride. 25 different types of pesticides were detected in the water, the sediment and the fish at varying concentration and at different points. Some of these pesticides have been banned globally over their harmful effects on people, aquatic life and the environment, including DDT, one of the most powerful yet controversial poisons the world has ever known. Promoted as a wonder chemical in the control of malaria and other pests, DDT was banned for agricultural uses worldwide in 2001. It is highly soluble in water and has been known to affect reproduction in humans. It's also classified as a possible cause of cancer in humans. And the effluent from the Kodiaga prison and River Kisat had higher loads of it. Also detected in the samples was endosophan, an insecticide and a known neurotoxin globally banned in 2012 and which causes birth defects, and Mirex, which also lingers in the environment and is a known possible cause of cancer. DDT belongs to a group of chemicals that are known as organochlorines. They are highly persistent in the environment. They can stay for several years without being broken down. Exposure to DDT makes the body adapt such that uh, the body will destroy any chemical, whether useful or not. That means uh, you try to treat somebody with a drug, but because their liver is destroying it, they, they don't get healed. The bacteria E. coli and other forms of fecal coliform were found at all 28 sampling points. They can cause waterborne bacterial infections and foodborne bacterial infections when contaminated fish is undercooked or consumed raw. A lot of imbalances that happen within the water uh, have a lot of effects, a lot of dynamics that we may not be able to essentially pin up. But we know that different uh, types of aquatic animals feed on different types of nutrients. And as I had said earlier on, the algae that we are seeing here at certain level is very useful for the animals, for the aquatic animals, because that's what they feed on. But when it reaches to a certain point and covers the water, then you don't have oxygen, particularly at night, that leads to death of a number of fish. And with the spectacular decline of the lake's greatest gift, the Lake Victoria is now a textbook case of human-caused extinction. And the people of the lake who are riding the wave of plenty now face a similar fate as the fish.
Near shore fishing was good enough until the once crystal waters turned poisonous. Now fishermen have to set out into the open waters and with nets with progressively smaller mesh, hauling out younger fish that should be left to reproduce. <laughs> Out in the open lake where the water is still cleaner, those who can keep fish in cages. For the farmers, these floating fish farms are netting them returns. But it's still hardly enough to satisfy the insatiable demand. The 2019 budget policy statement pegs local fish production at 180,000 tons a year against a demand of 500,000 tons. George Okeo is a cage fish farmer and a businessman who brings in fish imports. Early 90s, I was in the university and I was born in fish, was bred in fish, and I used fish to sell to be able to take to pay for my fees. Fish used to be landed in a beach, over 1,000 tons, metric tons, in a day. Now, you can hardly get 200 kgs of fish in a day. And this is a community that the only thing that they knew was about the fish itself. So there is no fish. That is the reality. There is no fish. In 1999, in Kisumu, or around Lake Victoria, there were nine fish factories that were processing Nile perch and, pro and exporting to Europe. From that time up to now, there is only one factory that is operating. Why? There is no fish. Kenya recently turned to China to plug the deficit, and which remains Kenya's top source of fish imports. Frozen tilapia and mackerel make up 85% of these imports. In Kisumu, the subject of fish imports from China is a heated affair. Traders like Miriam Nyango complain that the cheap imports have driven away their customers. Poverty is not a problem. So, if you have a cheap price, you can buy cheap. And you can buy 500 per kilogram. So, if you have a cheap price, you can buy 500. You can buy 500. You can buy 300. Caroline Auma, another trader, shares her sentiments. How much is it? Itakuwa mbaya kabisa. Itakuwa mbaya. Unajua saizi hata watu waja trust samaki. Awa, customer sawajui kama hii ni ya le, kama ni ya chena, jua wajui. Na unajua kitambo kulikuwa customer kikuja. Hawezi akakuliza hii ni yetu ama ni mgeni. Sasa lazima akutrust kabisa. Ikiendelea hivyo watu watacha kukula samaki juu. Kuna wakati enye wali samati yo. Samaki enye natoka China. Inaleta ugonjwa wa kama kansa. Sasa kuna mwenye nakubali. In October 2018, President Kenyatta hinted at a ban on fish imports from China. China saw it as a trade war and threatened to reciprocate. The move to ban imports was also on the back of reports that the China fish was tainted with heavy metals. But after a month of a back and forth, Kenya seemingly resigned to the reality that there were fewer options. And so the China fish stays on Kenya's menu. In Kisumu, the fish from China is imported mainly by East Africa Seafoods Limited, operated by Alpha Group, and Jojo Keo's Migingo Fisheries. I do farmed fish. I have a cage in the lake. But I also have uh, yeah. imported fish. So it's a choice of the customer. There are customers who come to me and are ready to pay 800 shillings for the caged fish from the lake, but I can't produce enough for them. 
a middle class can go and afford fish for 800 shil Kenya shillings per kg. That lady who is in uh, Aslam in Kisumu need to eat fish and we are providing fish of 150 shil uh, shillings per kg for example. They can be able to afford because of their size and they have to eat it nutritionally, it's good for them. And as such, traders and individuals flock to his go-down in the mornings to buy cheaper fish from China. It is then transported to various parts of a country. Isa Juma says he's rushing to catch the transport to Mumias, where his family is waiting for the carton of frozen fish he just bought. A study done by the University of Nairobi in 2019 found that the fish imported from China had traces of mercury, lead, arsenic and copper, even though the Kenya Bureau of Standards then denied that the fish posed any danger to human health. Migingo Fisheries also maintains that the fish they bring in is unsullied. It comes with a quality certificate that it has been tested. And that is done by Kenya Bureau of Standards. Because what they do is they contract a local organization on the other side to do a test for them based on the standards. And this one is an international one, Bureau Veritas. So they cannot load any container to come here without that. When it reaches Mombasa, Kenya Bureau of Standards pick samples from uh, when they are doing their verification. They pick samples of our fish and take to their lab and analyze. So we have never imported fish that, uh, as far as we are concerned, that has heavy metals, that has any sort of uh, contamination. We did our own tests on the fish we had bought from the depot. The fish was highly contaminated with lead at 42.7 parts per million against a recommended threshold of 0 0.1 parts per million. It also had high levels of zinc, iron and copper. It was also laced with a concussion of seven highly poisonous pesticides way above the maximum allowable limit. It's purely bad manners in Lake Victoria for people to import tilapia. Why do people import tilapia? When we just do simple, simple conservation measures and we get good, nice tilapia. And you know what happens with these imports from China. You have read a lot of stories about use of antibiotics and the environment under which that fish is reared. So we are going into problems because of our failure. We are taking our responsibility by pointing out that, in our opinion as toxicologists, these chemicals are there. But uh, now finding out who is the culprit in the contamination, I think that should be followed. There are policies of to protect the environment. I think uh, that is what has lapsed. What we can do is uh, first is to be, have behavior change and uh, the policies that are there, they need also to be revised and see whether are they serving us. Are they good policies? If they are good, are they being implemented? Who is responsible for implementing them? Are they sleeping on their jobs? And a freshwater lake is much easier to clean of affluence if we are serious. I don't think the situation can be allowed to go on as it is today because I think there's a very renewed vigor, both in the national government and the county government. If, if, in fact, in the regional environment as a whole, to ensure that we don't let the lake decay. But from the lake's gloomy shores, it's difficult to envision a rebirth anytime soon. The throng of birds that once enlivened the scenery have since moved on to more hospitable homes, and all that's left are scavengers foraging for scraps as does the community. There are those who fear that the lake is too far gone and will never really be as it was. But nature can bounce back. Over the past 100,000 years, the lake has completely dried up at least three times. There was a time when uh, Lake uh, Naivasha was also said that uh, it's remaining with only like uh, 40 years to disappear. And I think uh, some efforts were made to improve that. So I don't know how long it will take Lake Victoria, but if we go that way, 
it can also it can also disappear but so what if the lake was written off and left to die for the fishermen plying its bays the women selling fish scraps on the lake's beaches and for the millions of people whose fate is tied to the lake there will be nowhere to turn on their long voyage to oblivion Sheila Sendeo, NTV. Ah uh -huh.